next speaker, a man who needs no introduction anywhere in the civilized world, the one and only Jim Ruda. He wrote over 100 lives in his first year as a life insurance agent at age 22. He entered management at 25 and led one of Canada's largest life insurance agencies with 250 agents by age 40. God, I'm 45, and that just made me feel like a real loser. All right, Jim. I got to step my game up. Today, he coaches a roster of agents ranging from MDRT aspirants to top-of-the-table qualifiers. Jim is the president of AdvisorCraft Media and tactical coach, helping agents maximize their performance. Once again, give it up for the king of sting, the Count of Monte Pistol, the one and only Jim Ruda. <laughs> I could, yeah, I could, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do uh, my, my chest is still sore from hitting a guy, what is he, eight feet tall? Who does this? Uh, who does this? Anyway, listen, um, I'm so excited to be here. I always am. Remember something, this is for you to help you be better. It's the only reason Tom Love does this. And I gotta tell you, if this is value to you, I encourage you to help build this for next year. Because it just matters that much. You know, my whole raison d'etre, maintenant en français, the, my whole reason for being here is to preserve, promote, and propel the noble profession of selling life insurance. <laughs> Mike? That's what I'm here for. There's a lot of help on the other side. There's a lot of help doing a lot of other things, financial planning, investment planning, retirement planning, all those, everything that ends with planning. There's a lot of help for that. But this, and this is what Tom's trying to do here, is how important this is. Now look, let me get right, right, right into this. This is a picture, actually, I, I, I took recently in Mexico. But I know what, a lot of people look at it this way. You know, that it's sort of like, uh, this is what they think about the industry. Opportunity is nowhere. We kind of look at it that way. But in fact, the truth of it is that opportunity is now here, right now, right where we are in these times. And I, my job a little bit to wrap up everything that we've heard in the last day or so. And we've heard some extraordinary things, some great people, all the way from Tom and David and Arwen today and, and, and Sandy and, and Van and George and, I mean, I forgot somebody already, I'm in big trouble. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? But the opportunity has never been better than it is right now. Why? Because as the world gets more and more complicated, people need more and more help to pick their way down that rough and rocky road to financial security and financial success. Peter, and that's exactly the kind of thing that you do. I'm going to talk to you today about 10 ways. Actually, the rest of it says nine ways, which is an actual interesting thing for me. Um, note to self, try to coordinate PowerPoint. But in any event, these are ideas from icons. And that's what I've been doing my entire life. But before I get to that, let me ask you this question. How long does it take for the average person to become a life insurance sales professional? It's a trick question. Because the average person will never become a life insurance sales professional. And that's absolutely true. Average people don't make this. That doesn't work for them. Average people don't do So here's the point. If you're in this business, and if you're achieving any level of success, you're already way above average. Lois, you're already doing things that average people would never even contemplate doing. So that's just the way. Now, before I get into the body of my talk, let me just make this one admission. I know Sandy was making an admission earlier. I appreciated that. I think transparency and honesty is very important. And I want to just say this. I am a researcher. Now, in a lot of places, they would say that, they would call that a thief. Um, but the truth of it is, my ideas have come, you know, Melissa, from all kinds of people from all around the world for many years, like a 1978 article that your grandfather was in in the New York Times, Ben Feldman, 
from George Sigerson, from Van Miller, from Tom, Tom Love, and everybody else we could ever imagine. I have just been creatively researching all this information and then selling it back to other people. <laughs> it's, it's really my thing. But here's the truth of it. If I can see further, if I have done more, if I can bring you a message that matters, it's only because I have stood on the shoulders of those giants who were here before me. And if I possibly could be a shoulder like that for you, then you know, Benny, I can die a happy man. And I'm not kidding. They told me years ago that if I had shot my branch manager in 1977 when I joined the agency, I'd have been out by now. <laughs> but, but I'm still in this business. I love it. I chose it. It chose me. And as you heard from Van Miller earlier on, the truth of it is this, why we need better information, why I want to help you re-energize your life insurance sales is because we do need better. Now, if it's one in five survive, one in eight survive, one in God knows how many survive in this industry to be at least an advisor of some quality, you know, Jeremy, if one in five, one in four, one in six, whatever the number would be. And then only one in 20 makes the million dollar round table, which Van, my good buddy, always says, that's scarcely enough money to put sandwiches in your lunch pail. You know, we need a little bit better help. And I'm hoping that I can help you do that with nine slash ten ways to re-energize your sales. And the first way is this, to prospect better. And remember this, I don't care what you call yourself, how you hold yourself out to the public, I don't care what it says in your business card. If you're going to be successful in this business, you are a prospector first. You are a prospector first. You know, uh, Al Granham, somebody I knew, I was blessed to know, at least a little, used to say, we have to spend 60% of our time in prospecting and promotion. That means three days a week. And you know what? Nobody does three days a week. How do I know? It's because we get like one or two appointments a week. That's what we're doing. We're not doing hundreds of appointments. We're not doing, and I'll talk more about appointments later. But is there line, this line SW5, it reminds me of something that I wish I had learned when I was a young agent. So then George and I, we, I would have joined George, and then at one time, what would have happened? We could have owned Winnipeg completely. But I didn't know this. And maybe you'll know this. That SW, 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 SW next. Some will, some won't. So what? It's not about you. It's about them. It's always been about them, and it'll always be about them. Some are willing to hear your story, and in fact, David, some are just waiting for you to call, if you only would. And how many of us won't make the call? You know? I remember it was an old cartoon, a TV show many years ago. I put up a sign, and people just keep sending me money. No! You don't just get a brand, you don't get anything, and people just don't send you money. It takes some work. And here's the thing, the average number of prospects that advisors have is what's most concerning here. People will complain, they'll say, they'll say about Van, the guy sells 1,000, 1,200 cases a year. How, well, I, don't, I, just, I just don't think the bastard does that. I, I, I th who's ever, ever seen them numbers, Jimbo? Have you? Have you? But you think about this. The average advisor has between eight and 10 prospects they're going to see in the next three or four weeks. The average top of the table producer has like 180 to 300 prospects they're gonna see in the next three years. They've got a long list. Van has got a long list of people who are phoning him because, remember the call me if letter? Well, you know what? They inherited some money. You know, they, they, somebody got sick. Something happened in their lives. So that's what happens. So we find out that the difference between average and awesome is an awful lot of prospect. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. And about what you want to create for yourself. And this has worked so very well for so many of the people that I have the great blessing to work with is to create a top 20 list. In fact, we saw some of I think Sandy had this up there. 
top 20, top 15, top 30, top 50. I don't really care. <laughs> but you should have a list of your top prospects that you're going to be, that's on your list, that you're going to be calling on a regular basis. And then you work from that. You take one, you, you sell one, you replace it. Is how that goes. And I think one of the other things we need to know about prospecting is this, is that prospecting is not finding buyers. And this is very counterintuitive. I, 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 I thought for sure that was, I'm looking for people to buy. What the hell, you, what kind of language do you folks up in Canada have anyway? You got a whole, you, I don't get it. Doesn't make any sense, no. You see, what it is, is prospecting, Jeremy, is eliminating non-buyers. Who's not going to buy today? Who's not going to go forward on this call? It's eliminating non-buyers. And you see, if you can't chance the no, you will never get the yes. You know how many people I, I talk to advisors, I said, oh, I got so many people I could call, I could call, and I could keep calling. It's unbelievable how many people I could call. They're just unbelievable. They're lined up. They've got lists. They've got phone numbers. It's, it's unbelievable. I said, well, are you going to call? Well, no, not today. I'm not feeling so well today. Maybe tomorrow I'll call. But today is not such a good day. I think Tuesdays are a bad day. Wednesdays is better, but not, maybe not Wednesday. It could be Friday. Maybe Saturday. I don't know. Then they don't call anybody. Give them a chance to say no especially your friends. Your friends are all using you, as we know, you know, Wendy, as an excuse. Well, you know, uh, Wendy, I have a friend in the business. Make honest people out of them. <laughs> At least ask. At least ask them once. And as you heard from Van earlier this, uh, yesterday, or yesterday, you know, you retain and you recall the no's. You retain and recall. That means, as Van said, you know, if there's 10, 3, 1, let's just use that. That nine are in the garbage? You know, my old buddy Jack Kinder. Well, you know what, uh, Jack, Jack Kinder from, uh, from Dallas? You know, Jim, we're working shoulder to shoulder with our clients, and that's how we're doing this. But Jack would say, well, you know, there's sometimes, you know, you, you had a bad, yeah, bad call, Sandy, with your prospect, and what you do then is, is you, you, you take the card and you, and you scrunch it all up and you, and you throw it in the garbage can, and then you kick the garbage can right across the, across the office. But no, you don't. You retain this. Anybody here know who Paul Marcarelli is? Yeah, Paul Marcarelli. Who is Paul? He is the Verizon guy. Can you hear me now? Can you, hear, can, you, can you hear me now? Remember that guy? Isn't that your job as a prospect? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Oh, no? Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? And we just keep on calling. That's what Van does. He never run out of prospects. You find 10, you've always got 10. Okay, maybe one is a bit cranky you don't want to talk to. I tell you something, I said this the other day too. I have a number of clients that make eight-figure incomes. Eight. When I say eight figures, I'm talking the left-hand side of the decimal point, right? I'm talking real money. And, yeah, that'll be funnier later on on, on replay. Um, <laughs> but eight-figure, and, and both of them say this. They say, I will keep calling until the prospect tells me to go fly a kite. <laughs> and one of them says, yeah, as, as, as long as they don't tell me to go fly a kite, he says, I'll, I'll keep calling back. He says, until I, don't dec I decide I no longer like them. And then, to heck with them. But generally speaking, I will call as long as it takes. And you all know this. There's some people you called a long time ago and nothing worked out, but you call again, you maybe sort of forget you'd called them, you call, and it's, it's been a year or two. Those people are still out there. Can you hear me now? And you want to use what, I, what Van does, and Van's got so much smart stuff, just like, but everybody has smart stuff, gee. But I talk about revelation questions. Revelation questions are those questions that you ask that reveal the value of what you do to your prospect. Only they say it. And you know, Michael, if they say it, they own it. And what does Van say? What are some of those questions? I'll talk about this a little bit later on, too. But the idea, like, you know, would you like to become, the, if, you, if I could show you how to, you could be the beneficiary of your own life insurance policy while you were still alive, would that be worth, say, a 20 or 30 minute conversation? See, that's a revelation. I 
So I could say, you could be the beneficiary of your own policy. Or I could say, if I could show you a way that you could be, would that be interesting? That sort of thing. And of course, we heard this from Sandy this morning. You don't have to go very far to prospect. You prospect in your own clientele. You don't prospect in your neighborhood. Turner Thompson had such a great story, and I love this. We, you know, and, and you, we, we used to think, when we used to hear about the poor suckers in Debit, you know, 12 to 15 uh, square blocks, we used to think, well, those poor bastards, it's just a horrible thing. They only, they only can work in there, except that was perfect, because that meant they could own their territory. Do you own your territory? And if you don't, why not? Why don't we have what I call courtesy calls to our own clients? Hey, Mike, Jim Ruder, your insurance agent calling this. I just want to say, look, this is just the courtesy call, so don't freak out. And what do they do? They go, and you can just talk, right? One of those things to talk about during what happened during COVID, and people had such a terrible time. I'll never forget this, because I'm trying to think of what to do. I hadn't talked to Van for a while. I hadn't talked to anybody, because, you know, probably COVID went down the line on the phone or Zoom. It was... It was, it was still early. And we didn't know what to do. But I, I thought about this, and I thought, well, I'm going to phone Van, see what he's doing. I have an idea. I've done something. I ask what Van does. I said, well, Van, what are you doing? He says, well, pretty much the same thing I always do. I, I call up. Are you okay? You know, do, do you need anything? Do you have any questions? It was a little bit different than that, more or less, but that's roughly it. I said, isn't that the weirdest thing? That's exactly what we've been doing. I said, I said Van, how is it working? Killer! It's ridiculous. Hey, I said, how do you deal with COVID? He said, not a problem. I bring lawn chairs. I'll sit on the front porch. I'll wear one mask, two masks, 200 masks. I'll take whatever you need. I'll do whatever you want. That was Van. I go, well, Van. And I think, I wonder what the heck they're doing in England. So I phone my pal, Tom, uh, Tony Gordon. Tony, what are you guys doing? How are you coaching your clients, your advisors? What are you doing? Peter, what is it? He says, well, I, I, I won't fake the English accent. But he says, well, honestly... He says, it's not that hard. What we're doing is we're making phone calls to all our clients. I said, what are you saying? He says, well, you know, it's Tony Gordon, your insurance agent. Are you okay? Do you need anything? Do you have any questions? I said, oh, my God. By the way, you know how many people had their best year in 2020? Probably some of you in this room. It was ridiculous. And then their next best year was like 2021 and then 2022. And it's just getting better all the time. Why? Because it's getting... See, people... See, it took a global plague for people to realize they might just die. <laughs> they weren't sure, but now they kind of get a sense of it. Right? That's what it took. So, but there's a missing gap. See, for all the prospecting we do, and I'm speaking at uh, MDRT uh, doing a focus session in, um, in Vancouver this June about how to, uh, five C's of, do, of becoming a uh, social media video all-star. Talk about video. Because uh, I do a lot of video. And you've seen my, some of my stuff maybe on my table. And there's, so you have all the social media marketing. You have all kinds of marketing. I don't care, but there's all kinds of marketing. From brochures and flyers and you know, newsletters and you know, social media posts and videos and you know, so YouTube, whatever. Then there's this important part like selling. And the problem is a like missing gap here. And it's that orange thing up there. Prospecting. Which means... Converting some of those leads into actual people that buy. And you know how you, I don't know if you ever, you want to, you want to write this down. Uh, here's how you convert them. You ask to meet with them. I know it's complicated, but it ask, you just ask them. And by the way, for all the words, for everything I've seen about all the, I've been at this for 47 years. And for all of that, it boils down to, you know, if I can ask in a nice way, if I can do it in a proper sort of fashion, Heard a bit of that from Arwen. You heard that from pretty much everybody all day. From David, from, from Tom, from, from, you know, from Turner. Just ask, why do we love Turner? Besides the fact that he looks like he's 50 and he's 100. Why do we love, <laughs> why do we love this guy? Because he's so easy to talk to. Don't you love names of people? Like his parents say, let's give this young feller a name. It'll sound like a law firm for his whole life. Like, who are you with? I'm with Turner Thompson. <laughs> like, you know, like, brilliant. His parents are like geniuses. 
Anyway, so what else is there? Well, there's another thing. It's called positioning better. How do we position the product to make sure that more people take advantage of it? Because that's a big problem. Because we get there, we've got nothing to say. Okay, first of all, we have to remember this key deal. We cannot have an SOS problem. And I'll tell you something. In this business, and it's the reason that I am in the life insurance business, is because of that problem, SOS. The shame of selling. You know, I, I, I was working with a company a number of years ago. I can't say who, Edward Jones, but we were, we were chatting with them. And I had at the, at the, my last slide came up, and it said, when you help more, you sell more. And some partner had like a nervous breakdown. Uh, oh, ah! I said, why? Why? Well, you can't, well, we, we, we don't say sell here. I, by the way, I have no idea why everybody that I quote sounds like this. I have no idea. But anyway, they all do. I said, we can't, we, we can't, we don't say sell here. I said, well, well what do you do? He said, well, here's what we do. Um, we will uh, visit with our clients. We will uh, gather up their information. We will uh, analyze their situation completely from top to bottom and totally you know, using uh, the most popular and the most competent uh, software. We will provide them with many options from which they can choose to purchase on their, in their own time of their own goodwill whenever they choose to do that. But we don't sell them anything. I said, well, that might explain part of it. By the way, these people in Canada... Their sales, their rate of life insurance sales in that country was 0.5 apps per month. Their dream goal, one app per month per advisor. That was their dream. Oh, if we could just get to one, wouldn't this be amazing? I think they were misinterpreting the idea behind being number one. But anyway... No shame of selling. What shame could there be in a business where you bring people prosperity where they have none? What shame could there possibly be that you can help people do things they would never do except that they're with you? What shame could there be that you bring money, everybody else brings bills? What shame could there be to making sure that we cancel mortgages, we don't expect upfront early payment? What shame could there be in a business that is as noble as that? I'll tell you what, none. But we have to do that. We have to remember that. And I'll tell you why. That's why I'm here on this stage. For as long as I can be here, Tom, that's what I want to do. But now you can reposition planning with what I call essential financial security. And that's the next thing. And I could go into this in great detail for a whole hour, but I won't. But EFS is essential financial security. And to me, this is something that everybody can do, Michael, without a plan. Do you want, when you die, would you rather leave your house or a mortgage to your family? All these questions that Van has used over the years. Would you, you know, you think about, well, I'd rather leave them a house. Kids live in my own neighborhood. You know, we don't, we don't lose a second parent, like Van would say. We, it's something special. But these are things... You know, and I'm, I'm <laughs> my pal Sanjay Tolani, and uh, David mentioned him the other day. And people say, well, how much life insurance do I need? Now, we can go do a big plan, and we can do all this stuff, but what does Sanjay say? He's got a PhD in finance and, and, and financial planning. He did 1,201 times MDRT last year. 1,201. Benny, that's a lot. Like, that's a lot. And so, but what does he say? He says, how much life insurance? It's easy. You need, to, you need to, 10 times your income. 10 times your annual income. And they say, well, why do you say that? He says, everybody knows. And by the way, is it 10 times? 10 times is a good number. If you Google how many, much insurance you need, they'll say 10 times. I go further. I say, well, 10 times will give you half your income to your family at 5%. 15 times will give you 75% of your family's, of your current income to your family, Jeremy. And then 20 times will give you 100%. Well, 100% is like way too much. Really? <laughs> How much money of your current income do you spend now? And everybody will tell you, well, well uh, uh, you know, all of it. You know, and then some. Right? How do we know? Credit cards, lines of credit, HELOCs, you know, that kind of thing. 
Right? That's how we do it. So we present. So these are the things we do first, and then we move up. We have the essentials first. We have the plan, and then we add the extras. So that means that you'll never get stuck by one of these deals, and it's probably happened to somebody in this room for sure. You know, where you get, you get the plan, well, you we better put that whole plan together. It better be a very big thing. We can work that plan out. And it takes two weeks, three weeks, two months, four months, six months. We do all this. By the time you get to the situation, something has happened. Their insurability ain't quite the same. It makes a big difference. When we're positioning a product, we lead with a targeted concept, not a fact finder. Again, I'll, I'll tell you this. Again, I, I'm stealing from everybody. But it's so cool. Like, what does Sanjay say about this? How can we go and we start talking to our prospects about stuff, and the first thing we start to say is, well, how much money do you have in the bank? How much does your wife weigh? <laughs> oh, that might be a little of an exaggeration. But you know, you think about the stuff, we, we have no right to ask, but we do have a right to ask some basics. Oh, Jim, but if, what if you pick two million and they need only a million and a half? Could you fix that? Yeah, and by the way, if they apply for two million and they need three million, you could probably include it. You could probably add that. Just, well, just give me another check. That would be okay. We could fix all of that. That's one of the ways. So we lead with a targeted concept. I'm going to go back for a second. Lead with a targeted concept, and this is the real key to so many advisors' success. I work with a guy in Toronto. His whole shtick is one thing. If I could show you how you can convert your taxes into charity and not disinherit your family, but disinherit the IRS, Canada Revenue, would that be a useful conversation the next 30 minutes? Does anybody say no to that, do you think? No, they don't. Why? He's interesting. If you want people to be interested, you have to be, I don't know, uh, interesting. But we forget. By the way, and that's why when you see great advisors up here, and I, and I, I, I I'll, Turner, don't you just want to hug that guy all the time, right? Van Miller, they go, like he's just like a fun, he's just like, and he's by the way, he's the shyest guy you can imagine. Not the heart, not the life of the party. You just want to just just love the guy. It's George, Wendy, you know the best secret out of the Feldman family. She goes, oh, she's great. And great legs, too, which I think is cool. <laughs> so you could have three or four approach concepts that you use, and then you ask questions. Because you know what happens? People will say, well, how, 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 how the hell how did I do that? How would I fix that? Well, what do you mean by that? That's what Van was saying, only in his own kind of weird way, because he goes, oh, Lord. <laughs> He's going to straighten me out. Big time later. But that's what happens. And then they ask, see, they ask you for help. And what happens? David, you become their advisor. They have made you their advisor. And then you can tell them anything. Because they've asked you to tell them. So what else is there? Well, you have to serve better. I've talked about this before. But you know, in the industry, in the financial planning industry, we talk mostly about the civilian uses of life insurance. Just the civilian uses. This is the easy stuff. This is the stuff everybody thinks. Uh, you die, we pay money. That's what it is, civilian uses. Oh, if you have a m large mortgage and you die, we'll pay off the mortgage. Okay. If you have a business loan, we'll pay off the business loan. You know, you, have to, you need a supply of income for your family to get, so they can continue to live in a style to which you hope they might become accustomed. Then you can do that. That's all civilian uses of the product. But you know what? When you go deeper, you discover that it's way more than risk management. And that's what drives me nuts about the CFP program, what it, the regulators in most jurisdictions. I spoke about this concept in front of a room like this full of regulators in November. I think the, the, it was our, uh, the Financial Advisors Association of Canada. I think they were trying to just X me out. And they thought, well, let's put them in front of the regulators. Maybe they can just blow them up. And I said just this, you know what, there's more to it than risk management, Lois. You can really expand this. And I started talking about ways that you could do it. And I went on and on. And you know, <laughs> at the end, the king of the regulators, like the head Oompa Loompa, shows up. And he says, Jim, shook my hand. He says, 
I have never heard this stuff. See, I have never, I, what? Flabbergasted. So we talk about the professional uses. You can be the beneficiary of your own life insurance policy while you're still alive. There's ways of using life insurance so that you can convert charity, or you can convert, you can convert, convert taxes into charity. Works in Canada, works in the United States, both sides of that coin. There's a way to do that. There's a way to take money out from the IRS, Canada Revenue Agency radar, and put it and just hide it over here. There's ways of doing that if you know what you're doing. My wife and I, not long ago, we, we bought a large insurance policy. And, 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 I, and my wife says, why, 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 why are we spending that kind of money exactly? I know, why? I said, well, Rhonda, what we're trying to do, we're taking money over here from always taxed and move it here to never taxed. That's what we're trying to do. My, my wife is just, okay, Jim, whatever you think. All right, that's what we did. And then, so we've had that plan for, I don't know, four or five years. And the other day, the, the, the invoice came through. We, we needed to spend, you know, and that's a five-figure sum. It's real money. She says, uh, I got to pay that bill again. I said, no, 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 no. No, Rhonda, it's not paying a bill. She said, well, what are you talking about? They asked, they're looking for, I got to make a payment here. No, no. I said, remember, we're just taking money from this pocket here, and we're putting it over here in this pocket, but it's still my pants. Remember that? Remember it's like taking out of one side of your purse and putting it in the other side of the purse, but it's still your purse? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I get that. I said, yeah, and in that transaction from this pocket to this pocket, you know what happens? They're going to throw in uh, 600 grand for Abigail, our daughter, if uh, you croak, because it happened to be hers, that one. And I said, um, and not, not that we're looking for that, Rhonda. Of course we're not. I'm just saying. Somebody asked me, by the way, years ago, said, Jimmy, you're a, like, I was like 37 years old, like I was like 50 years ago. And, um, and <laughs> the guy says, uh, you got like $3 million worth of life insurance. You're worth more dead than alive. You're crazy. What's wrong with you? I said, well, here's how I look at it. And maybe it'll apply to you. But I said, here's what I said. I said, look, um, honestly, this is how I look at it. My, when I, that kind of money will give my widow a better choice of daddies for my kids. Because rich widows can do whatever they want. Poor widows can be forced to make bad decisions. Amen, right? Yeah? And that's what we do. That's how it works. So it's more than, so there's, a, uh, there's other this stuff. When I talk about this, when I'm talking to Rhonda, I say, we're just rearranging our assets from this pocket to do this pocket from, you know, uh, where I, got, I, got, I, have, I have other money. We have from this pocket, right, into this pocket, still my coat. And Rhonda, what we're not doing is we're not throwing it away. We're not throwing it away. We're not spending the money in, in any normal sense. We're rearranging assets to maximize the, our estate and to minimize our taxes. That's what we're doing. So you can be the beneficiary of your own policy, and that's exactly how that works, at least one way. Something else that my, our buddy Tom Hagner talks about is that you can maximize your retirement income with cash value life insurance. What does Tommy say? He's got the greatest line ever, and I hate giving him credit for this. It's just, oh, well. But what does he say? He says, you know, spend all your money in retirement and leave your kids cash value life insurance. And that's the truth, you know, because there are three fears that people have in retirement. Just three fears. Not just three, but at least three. Number one, will my money last as long as I will? Doesn't matter how much money you got. I, know, I knew a guy recently, $50 million uh, estate. Uh, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's going to work. My father-in-law, who had more money than he needed, he used to say to me, Jimmy, Jimmy, will I be okay? Which is the question everybody has, right? Will I be okay? He says, I know Rhonda will lie to me, but you won't. I guess he thought I was had a little vicious streak in me. He says, no doubt, I've done the math. It turns out that as long as you, do, you don't live any longer than 196, you'll be fine. Okay, will my money last as long as I will? Number two, will there be anything left over? No, sorry, will my life have meant anything? Will there be any significance to what I have done? Now, when you're 40 years old, this doesn't cross your mind. You go, ah, screw that. 
Hey, my dad didn't leave me nothing. I'm not leaving nobody nothing neither. Hey, hell with it. You know, that's kind of the way we go. In our heads. We don't actually say these things. But in our heads. Or at least in my head. <laughs> but, you know, and the third thing is, will there be anything left over to leave to the people that I love? Will my, will my money last as long as I will? Will my life have any significance? Ella Joe Jordan. And, and, and will there be anything left over? And when you get close to the end, or closer, like now I know that the light at the end of the tunnel is actually a train, right? I, I'm, I'm 68. I know it's hard to imagine giving my boyish good looks. However, that's the truth. And so I say, well, I wonder what I can leave to them. By the way, it's like grandkids. So we turn the story, like uh, George was talking about grandkids insurance, and that's the same sort of thing from Wendy. We have this discussion. And grandkids, like a, I just love that old line. Remember that line? That, God, if I knew having grandkids was so much fun, I'd have had them first. <laughs> right? And so I don't really care if I leave much to my kids. They're mostly beyond help now. I blame that all on their mother. But... Well, one of, one of their mothers is dead, so that's easy to do because she can't come here and whoop me like a rented mule. But, but that's that whole thing about my grandkids. What am I doing for them? See, that's a professional use of life insurance. That's not a civilian use. I don't want to benefit if my, if my kids die. That's a horrible, disgusting thing. You guys are disgusting. I say, look, we're not buying life insurance on our kids. We're buying life insurance for our kids, for our grandkids. It makes that much. So maximizing retirement income, though, off topic. By the way, that maximizes their retirement income. You know, I've got a, my, my, my daughter, uh, who's 21, actually the, my last final hope, um, is, <laughs> has a, a very substantial life insurance policy. She'll never have to buy another one, technically. By the time she's 65, she'll have millions. That will help with her retirement. And you see, the difference between term and cash value life insurance is this. You know, term insurance, I say a T20. What do you, after 20 years, what do you have? Well, you've got a stack of paid invoices, the satisfaction of having bought the policy. You have the same deal all over again at the same face amount. And you got nothing, just nothing. You just keep on going, right? Just keep riding that same. What's cash value life insurance? And we don't call it permanent because that sounds scary. We don't even call it whole life, because that also doesn't mean, that's just weird. Cash value life insurance. You got cash value life insurance, what do you have? Well, you have the same pile of sta uh, same stack of uh, uh, paid invoices. You've got the same satisfaction for having protected your family. You've got a plan now worth about 75% more than it used to be worth. You've got every dime back that you paid in, and you have a plan where every year you put money in, it goes straight to savings. And you get it all back and then some. And it's tax-free. It's an uncorrelated fixed income asset. Can only go up in value, can never go down in value. It's not a bad thing. Now, is that where all your money should be? I don't know. George says the other day, he says, I wish I put way more into this. He only pays, he's only doing 400000 a year. He's such a slug with life insurance premiums. And I, I mean, I, I've just barely crossed over into six figures. But that's belief, and that's why he's been so successful. And when used as intended, cash value life insurance is not an expense. It's a contribution to an asset. And that's where it's not spending money at all. Number four, let's get at it. Advise better. Well, first of all, we want to use, we want to specialize. Pick a concept, pick an idea. Tom does that. George is good at a bunch of things. He has staff to do a lot of other things, but he works with his clients. He's a real relationship builder. That's kind of his deal. Van Miller has a concept that he promotes all day long, and everybody knows him for that. You know, ask him, how much business insurance do you sell, Van? Corporate-owned business insurance. Zero! Huh, he just doesn't do that. Why? Is, it, is it a bad thing to do? No, it's a good thing. This is not him. So we specialize. I talk about ICON protocol. ICON protocol, part of my, my coaching program. ICON stands, ICONs are those people recognized as representative symbols of what it means to be the best in the business. That's why the people on this stage, except for me, were icons. Representative symbols, Joe, of what it means to be the best in this business. That's what they are. 
And it's also an acronym for what it means to do best at this. And what is that acronym? Inspiration. Every advisor who's any good is inspired to do this. I think about your grandfather. I'm thinking, of, you're about his same height as he was, I think. Um, he was just a little guy. Most powerful guy ever. Because he was inspired. And you could be inspired about any part of this business. And if you're inspired, people want that. Your inspiration becomes their urgency to take action. That's what every good advisor does. All around, Sandro Forte, uh, Bupinder Anand. You pick a name, anybody. Uh, Mark Hannon's in, in, uh, in San Francisco. Guy Baker in, in Orange County, California. All of these folks. So you want to inspire. What did Van say? In fact, Van says, my job is to inspire people to take action. Action they wouldn't have taken otherwise but they should take, and they need to take, and it's a good thing they take it. My job is to inspire them, Benny. That's the job. So you don't need to be, and you shouldn't be, a doctor of all theologies. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for some reason in this business, we've got lost on this. You know, it's, it's, it's as if you go to your doctor, and your doctor says, welcome, my name is Dr. James W. Ruder. I'm a specialist in all theologies. Yes, sir, I do cardiology, I do uro uh, urology, I do oncology, I do immunology, I do uh, proctology, I do astrology, because it sounds the same. I do, um, I do neurology, I even do geology, in case you have rocks in your head. Yes, sir, I do all theologies. You don't go to doctors like that. George has been nearly dead four times in the last 14, 12 years. He wouldn't really tell, he wouldn't really know that. I used, to, I used to complain. I think his best year was like the year you got sick the first time. It was his best ever year. And I phoned him up. I said, well, George, this isn't, you're not playing fair with everybody. What are you talking about? I said, everybody knows you're like deathly ill. So everybody wants to buy like a memento policy. <laughs> I bought from George the year he died. <laughs> and then you don't die. And so then the next year, they're still into, oh, I have to buy a memento policy. And they try that again. Right? Yeah, he'll also straighten me out later on. You know, the Mayo Brothers, it was over 100 years ago, created the idea of specialists in the medical field. I don't know. Maybe we could catch up to that. And I'll show you a few things about that. Why don't we collaborate with other advisors and centers of influence who work in your target with your audience. Why don't we collaborate? I don't do disability insurance, but you know what? I know that he does. I'm going to work with you. You and I will share business. Would that be okay? That would be fine. Oh, well, I want half the business. No, give him most of the business. Why? Because then he's got, an, he's got a dog in the race, and he'll actually do it. You know, anybody know the name Jim Rogers? Formerly top, uh, well, top of the table chairman, president of the Million Dollar Roundtable. Jim Rogers made top of the table almost his entire career on 30% commission, 30% of the commission. You know what his job was? Uh, I'd like you to meet uh, Wendy. Uh, George, would you meet Wendy? And you go, and, and, and 30% if you get the deal. That's all he did. I think Clay Gillespie was the, you know, the, benefic the beneficiary of all that stuff. So you can do that. You can then coach your centers of influence to refer to your specialty. I'm a specialist, and I can help you with some of this stuff, how to convert taxes into charity, for instance. How to, how to, how to move retained earnings out of your corporation on a tax-favorable basis. I can help you do that. And if you run into any clients like that, you can let me know, Mr. CPA. And what I'll do is I'll just take the names out. I'll give you an, I'll show you how we can handle that. And then you spend your time, Peter, coaching people on how to use you. Got a friend? Uh, she's part of Solus, our program. Found her, she, I found her, she was just a slug. She was only doing like quarter of the table. Last year, she finished, she, last year she finished five times top. She spends most of her time doing just that. Most of her time doing just that. Coaching centers of influence to refer to her. She can't keep up. Why? Because she's tremendous. She works like a fiend. She's trustworthy beyond belief. So they trust her. You know, you can lead an ecosystem of specialists. And when you do that, your business can explode. See, if I were, if I were working here, 
You know, if I lived in Murfreesboro or Franklin or, Ten, or uh, uh, where are we? Oh, yeah, Nashville. Um, it, but you think I'd be doing Tom's business? No, I wouldn't be doing Tom. See, I'm a, I'm a RHU, red-haired underwriter. So, so I, I'd probably do, be doing you know, income replacement. I'd be doing living benefits because that's kind of like my shtick. But if I ran into a case that I thought Tom could do, Tommy, do it. Pay me whatever you think is fair. We're all good. What else? Number five, build better. I think we have to sometimes, you know, as, as Van says this, Tom Hegnes says this, I said this. It doesn't really matter. But the truth of it is this. This is a words, stories, questions, and passion business. If you have the right words, if you can deliver them with passion, if you, you can set people up. And we saw some of that from Arwen earlier. You gotta say it the right way. You know, as you were talking, Arwen, earlier today, I was sending your stuff to a friend of mine who actually has pink buses in our city. She, I, I, I wasn't gonna tell her that you thought that was a bad idea, because. She's, she also owns her own airplane. She'd fly here and kick my uh, at, right away. She would do that. But, but it's the words. Do we say it the right way? Do we set it up so people were taking advantage of it? I'll tell you something else, what Arwen was saying. Do you think that only works with women? Do you think what Arwen, well, if you start talking to men, they'll get all freaked out if you make things simple. That'll freak them right out. You cold salad damn thing. Uh, eh, wrong, but thanks for playing along. In fact, all the great advisors in the world will take the complicated and make it simple. What do beginners do? Take the simple and make it complicated. That's what we, that's what we, I mean, we were, well, I had a guy one day, <laughs> never forget this. The guy says, he, I asked him what he did for a living. And he says, and he went on for like five minutes. I, I did, really, I, you know, I've been at this for a long time, but I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, what, for crying out loud, Chris, well, what the hell are you talking about? He says to me, Jimmy, I just want you to know, this is apparently the one guy who doesn't talk like that. Uh, he says, Jimmy, I just want you to know, here's the thing. I believe in a philosophy called professional confusement. I said, what? What? Sorry, what? What? Professional confusement. I said, what the hell is that? He says, professional confusement. It's where you use a lot of big words and big sentences, compound words, compound phrases, to make people think that you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Chris, you're not going to have a long career, but it's going to seem very long. <laughs> and you know what he did? He flipped it. Today, top the table producer. Changed. He no longer said the professional confusion. So we set conversation. I'd like to have a quick talk with you. Van talks like that. George talks. Go, let's go have a coffee. Just chat for a while. That's the simplest thing. You rubbing shoulders. That's the name for a book, by the way. Rub shoulders. Rubbing shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. Rubbing shoulders. What a book that is. But you see, rubbing shoulders. I just want to have a, just just have a quick chat. Just see how things are going. What do I have to say? Don't even worry about that. Just go there. It's like Sandy was saying this morning. What does Sandy say? He says, um, I didn't even get their names or anything. Your brother-in-law and somebody else. I don't even know their name, their phone number. I don't know nothing. It's okay. You'll get it. So the words are so important. So not meetings or appointments, because appointments are what you do with your, you know, uh, your, 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 your dentist. And I don't know about you, I'm not fond of dentists. I have a conversation, though. Oh, I'm going to go back for a second, because this is something really important. This is why, consistent, why consistency is so important, but consistent activity, why this business requires you to do a lot of work all the time. When you're working, I'll talk more about that later, but that formula is key to your success in this business. If I had learned this uh, 47 years ago, I wouldn't be here. I would be in Winnipeg with George, or I would, uh, we would have, you know, dueling condos in, in Florida, and uh, we'd be just and going to wonder what the poor people are doing. That's what we'd be doing. But I'm not. I'm here. And what does it say? A equals 1 over T. Your attitude, your sales attitude, your ability is equal to 1 over the length of time since your last sale. You made a sale yesterday. It's 1 over 1. 100%. You are killer. I just made a sale yesterday, Mike. Come on up. <laughs> yeah, you're going down, right? 
right? If it's one over, if it's 10 days to go, it's one over 10. 10%. Eh, still there, not so good. One over 20, 5%. Eh, you're stretching. One over 100, one over 200, nothing to talk about. And how many of us get into that thing? Well, I do 12 cases a year. I've got, well, I have 15 cases. Van said that the studies in Limerick said that they do 25 in Canada, 40 in the United States. I think that's so grossly overstated. It's like if somebody asks me how much I weigh, and I go, well, that's easy, 180. And I'm not 180. My left leg is 180. This one's a little bit different. Right? We lie to everybody. So consistent. So one, so I think I have a friend in the, in the business, makes about six, seven million dollars a year. And all of his five or six cases happen at the end of the year. It takes him all year to close them, and then he closes them. He is the most annoying SOB <laughs> from like March till like October. You want to kill the guy. And I've known him for 40 years. He's a good guy. But his attitude is equal to one over the length of time since his last sale. He didn't make a sale. He's not happy. So activity is so important. You want to get in the way of new business. Ben Feldman showed up in, in Winnipeg in 1979, 78, something like that when I was there. And er, 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 Ben Feldman is coming to the meeting. In 1978, everybody knew Ben Feldman. Maybe not today, because now we have to know Wendy. But back then... Ben Feldman. Ben Feldman comes up and he was just a little guy. I just, love, just love that man. He was so cool. He come up and he and he said, and now ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Ben Feldman. Ben. So Ben gets up. He gets up. He goes. He says there are three keys to success in the life insurance business. And he says, see the people, see the people, and see the people. And he sat down. <laughs> what? What? See the people. That's it. What's George's book called? In Search of Friends. See the People. What does Bruce Etherington say? See the People. That's the name of his book. He stole it from Ben, but Ben's gone now. So, but that's the deal. <laughs> you know, only insurance people can have black humor like that and think that's funny. My, my wife goes, oh, for God's sakes, Jim. Like the same story about you were saying yesterday about Pam. I say, Rhonda, wear black to, our, to, to my funeral. You should at least look unhappy. Right? You should at least look unhappy. Oh, Jim, don't say that. I said, it's going to be complicated for you. It's going to be a very challenging situation that day. Oh, she goes, oh, God, why are you saying? She says, I said, look, it's going to be weary. It's going to be a day of mixed emotions. On one hand, Jim is gone. Sad. On the other hand, you will just won the Jim Root a $5 million tax-free lottery. Yeah. So you're going to have mixed emotions. I said, kind of like kind of like watching your mother-in-law back your new Mercedes-Benz off a cliff. <laughs> so, we go into this, the big case trap. Here's another thing that we have in this business. And this is what, what leads to that 1 over uh, A equals 1 over, uh, 1 over T. Paul Tompkins, top of the table producer in Toronto, multi-million dollar, has billionaire, multiple billionaire clients. He says... He says, the scariest thing you can do is chase big business. And that's what he does. He says, it scares the hell out of me every day. I said, why? He says, because if you chase a big case and you don't get it, you'll have nothing in the mill, right? Because it'd be like Arwen, you were talking about the, the, the bright, shiny object. There it is! And it's all we can see is this bright, this globe over here of shiny. But he says, it's worse than that. I said, how do you mean worse than that? He says, it's worse than that because if you do get it, you still have nothing in the mill. And it's never good, says Paul, to have nothing in the mill. Ah. And that's why I'm here, to remind you of stories like that. So the big case trap. You, I asked, I was sitting in a, believe me, the day before the war started in Israel, I was in the Middle East talking with Sanjay Talani. And you know, I was asking, so the difference between in-person meetings and virtual meetings, well, what do you do? Like, here's a guy who's resi he's a tax resident of Dubai. One of his offices is in Singapore. He's got another office in Mumbai, India. When I caught him one day, he was in Hong Kong. So he's really just, you know, I don't know what the hell he does. I think he's just running from the authorities. That's all I can think of. <laughs> and I tell him that, too. That's why we're not talking. But 
But he had the perfect line here. He said this. He said, you are always in person to create a relationship, and then you can be virtual to maintain a relationship. You go, ah. See, there's another thing that pisses me off about agents. It's, they're so smart. I should be giving him stuff like that, but he gives it to me. But that's where it came from. We have a 340 performance week. Here's what I know. See, nine, if you have nine meetings or conversations a week, 40 weeks a year, that's 360 appointments. If you could pull that off, there is almost not a single person in this room, save and except for, say, Van, who have to cut back like 100% or 500%, and George. But, but if you could do nine a week for 40 weeks, there's not a person in this room that wouldn't double or triple their income. And you know I'm right. Well, what do we have? We have one appointment a week. You know, I had one guy said to me, well, I th how many did you have last week? He says, well, I think it was approximately um, one. <laughs> just approximately one. Shit. Doesn't matter. All right. So 340. You work three days a week in the business, selling, prospecting, marketing, doing revenue generating activities, and you work for 40 weeks a year. Why? Because around here particularly, last time I was here, we had to stay in the friggin' hotel because there was a tornado blowing by. And there's weeks like that here where you can have tornadoes. Where I come from, you have a friggin' blizzard for a week, everything's shut down. Right? Now in Winnipeg, if there's a blizzard, nothing shuts down. Because they've actually seen snow there before, and they're not as chicken as the rest of us in the rest of Canada. Simple stuff. What else can you do? Well, you can learn better. And this is where Van was saying the whole thing. That's why he started that whole talk yesterday. We have to learn better. If you don't want to know, it won't matter. Look, think about this. If you want to be average, no help is necessary. Just keep doing whatever you're doing. You know, if, it, if I'm not doing well, just keep doing it. A, average is easy. Average, best of the worst, worst of the best. Right? Average. However, if you want to be awesome, you're going to have to work, put in some time. You have to put in the study. You have to learn a few things. You're going to have to read. You're going to have to do stuff. have to put in the time. I talked to one of my clients recently. He's making about three fifty a year, and it was weird because I got him from one fifty to three fifty, and he's kind of stalling at one fifty. The hell is this? Couldn't figure it out. And I'm listening to him talk, and I'm listening. I said, Bob, how many hours a week do you put in? Oh, Jim, I put in a solid twenty. <laughs> Say what? Oh, tw twenty hours. Yeah, twenty hours. Yeah, 20 hours, Jim. 20 hard laboring hours. I said, ever, ever work at night? Never work at night, no. When do you start? 10? Yep, yep. Don't, take, don't work on Friday. Never work on Saturday. Nope. Gone by three. I said, so what you're telling me is you're actually killing it. For a guy that almost doesn't work, you're killing it. Because it turns out it takes more than that. I mean, the only time, you know, when you, you ask Van about when he works 20 hours, it'll be like Saturday, because he'll be here, and then he'll fly home, and then what do you have, 11 appointments? Yeah, 11 on Saturday. Most, most advisors are sleeping on Saturday, because I've had such a hard week, it's been so hard on me, I'm just, I'm just overwhelmed by this. <laughs> this is, it's, it's killing Jim, five, five, five hours of, of concentrated effort is, is, is gosh. God, I, I, the first question I had, I said, what do you do on Wednesday? And he goes, what? It takes time, and that's learning. Words, stories, questions, using scripts, ad-libs. Someone said this, ad-libs are for amateurs. I thought ad-libs were for, I, I, actually, I thought scripts were for stupid people. And I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to give you a whole new talk every time because that's how smart I am. Like Jethro from the Hillbillies, right? <laughs> Beverly Hillbillies. And I'm like, uh, I have a university education. And I can just do it. No, you can't. Nobody does it like that. Van doesn't. You could, Van could give the same sales presentation. Well, he does. 11 times on Saturday. It'll be the same damn thing. Unless there's a little tweak in who the prospect is and there'll be a little bit of a tweak. George... We'll talk about his bucket story, the stuff he showed the other day. He'll do that all the time. How do I know? Every time I see the guy, Jimmy, gets on a napkin, and we're having coffee. Let me show you how this, let me show you how this works. And he starts drawing. Every, am I right? 
Every time. I even have the napkins. For, I keep them. He, I got, and I, one day I got him to sign the napkin. Because I thought when George dies, this napkin is going to be worth real moolah. Right? And George, of course, just doesn't want to die. But anyway, that's how that's going. Rehearsing your scripts. Somebody said, well, Arvin was talking, was it, who was saying, or about role playing? We don't role play anything. You did. Yeah. Nobody, oh yeah, you, nobody role plays. Right? We don't, but you have to. I said this on, uh, on Wednesday, I think. You know, I, I worked with a, a guy like uh, Bruce Etherington, who was an amazing guy. And he would go to a, he would have a presentation, and he says, and at this point, I will take my glasses off, and I will just drop them on the sheet in front of me. And he actually does that. Like down to like what he's doing in the interview. And we don't do this. Jim, I got uh, much brighter than that. I know every Etherington's old, he's 83. Still making a serious eight-figure income, mind you. Yeah, well, he's just lucky. I personally do it this way. How, <laughs> how much money are you making? I'm up to 100 thou now, every second year. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, maybe we could learn from some of these people. Rehearse your practice. And Van said, why they, what, 150 times? What if it's only 30 times? It'd be a hell of a lot better than zero times. My daughter, my daughter, years ago when she was like grade nine, she had, she had to do a French um, uh, uh, video. And she says, Dad, you can shoot the video. You're a video guy. You can shoot the video. I said, I can. I said, do you have a script? Uh, no. I said, well, no script. I'm not, I'm not even dragging the, my, my stuff out if you don't have a script. Oh, Dad, please, Dad. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm not just going to wait here for you to play your way through this. I'm not editing anything. I don't want to edit this. I said, here's what you got to do. Sh write the script. So she spends 10, 20, well, it was only like a two-minute talk. Like, it wasn't a big deal. Write it down. I said, now, stand up over here, and I want you to read it to me 30 times. 30 times, Dad! That's crazy! Do you want me to shoot the video or not? <sighs> okay, so she did it. Shot it, one take. She knew her stuff. That's the rule, right? That's, a, that's like the speaker's rule. You have to know your stuff, know who you're stuffing, and then you can stuff them. <laughs> and that's how that went. So you practice on previous. Mark Hanna, in, in, you know, President of Million Dollar Roundtable years ago, told me, he says, whenever I need to practice a new idea, I just go to the prospects who used to say no to me. But I still have them, just like Van does, like George does. Like, just because they said no doesn't mean they're bad. In fact, they get better with age. Did you know that? Prospects get better with age. If I phone you 12 times, after a while, you go, oh, it's you again. How's your kids doing? Did your daughter graduate or not? Like, that's what you know, will happen. Previous prospect, Mark Hanna said, I always had 16,000 extra prospects kicking around because he was doing stuff on, on, on the tech side of it. And he, that's who he calls. Nothing to lose and everything to gain. Prepare and practice your sales like you can earn a great deal of money if you make a sale. I know it's a crazy concept, but can you make a lot of money in this business? Like stupid. Like George always, George keeps telling me something. <laughs> Jim, what if they find out just how little we know actually? <laughs> and how much money we make? <laughs> Nobody should ever know this. But in fact, what do you know that most people will never know? You know how to build relationships, Mike, with people. You do things, Melissa, that most people won't do. Companies, company officers who have no frigging idea what the, what the job is. They wouldn't do it. They don't, they, don't, they don't own any product. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it on a bet. That's what you do. That's why you're going to do a lot. Number seven, you want to present better. Remember this. Nobody needs life insurance. And you got to stop telling people they need it. Because they don't. Why? There is no jurisdiction that I'm familiar with, and I've worked around the world, that says you, that you mandate you're, you're married, you have three kids, you make 200000 a year, you've got to make X amount of life insurance. No mandates anywhere. So you don't need it like you need car insurance. No mandate. It's all about what you want. You don't need any, but you might want some. And we don't use jargon either. This is where I was picking up on, Ar on, on Arwen's stuff. I'm going, man... 
I can't use jargon. I was fighting with this woman, Whitney Hammond in Burlington, Ontario. She'll probably, anyway. So she says to me, she says, well, you know, women just don't trust men because they use all this fancy language. I said, who the hell are you talking to? Like, I coached her. <laughs> we could get that. But we don't. We don't. And by the way, men, women, everybody, talking like a grade eight level of English. That's the level. See, if anybody can understand, then anybody can buy. That's how that goes. What else? Well, I said this before. Pros make the complicated simple. Uh, amateurs uh, make the simple complicated. And that's how you can tell. If you can't boil it down, you know, what did, what did uh, Einstein say about this? Einstein said, if you can't tell me simply, you don't know your subject well enough. Now, why would we trust him? He was only a friggin' genius. Right? But that's the truth. You could, can you PowerPoint your presentation? Can you set it up so people can actually follow along? No, Jim, I don't really know how I'm going to go. Could go anywhere here. I'll start here, but I'll go over there, and then I could come back. No. Figure out a way that works. Arwen, nobody can do a presentation like you did this morning without being a real pro. That was like first class. I do none of that. I'm like, I'm, I also have a lot of class, but it's like usually third or fourth. Like, it's not that. <laughs> it's not that up. Right? But it takes practice. Do you think she practiced that talk before? Or do you think maybe that was like the first time she did this? Oh, well, I don't know, Jim. I can't really tell. Well, it's possible that she did. Well, maybe she didn't practice. You know what I'm getting at? She practiced that. And so can we. You can PowerPoint it. You tell stories. Why? To explain their why. Sometimes I'm up to here with about my why. Let me tell you my why. And I think on balance, we talk way too much about ourselves. You know, enough about me, let's talk about you. What do you think about me? <laughs> right? That's kind of how we go. And then don't give me this humble brag stuff. Well, I'm so proud that I get a chance to work with Peter Nelson because if it wasn't for me, he'd never get the top of the table. And I'm just so honored that he has been so successful because of my help that I just couldn't be more proud and happy for him because of me. And right? <laughs> we do this. You see that all the time. You know how, where that is? Check it up on Facebook, all over the place. The humble brag is just the goofiest thing ever. So what else? I was told I can go over. That's why we're still here. And if you leave, I'll still keep going. Anyway, do, you do their homework for them. You interpret il illustrations. You interpret illustrations. You don't just give them out. You interpret them. You do their homework. You explain what this means. And as a friend of mine, David Hull says, David says, I will never get involved in an illustration war. Because there's only one thing I know about illustrations, Mike, here's what it is. It will never be like that. Even on a term insurance deal. Well, 47 years, here's what your premium will be. Supposing you're still alive and we haven't fixed this or you haven't left. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't work. Don't get involved in that. Number eight, close better. And remember this. This is a huge thing. You will sell insurance in proportion to what you own. The more you own, the more you will sell. You know how many people I talk to who say, well, do you have any insurance? No, well, no, I, it's not for me. <laughs> it's for those stupid people, but not for me. You know. Right? Now, do they actually say that? No, but that's what they mean. Right? If you believe and you buy more, you'll sell more. That's why I had like three million when I was 37 years old. Someone says, well, here's what you need to buy a million. It's like nothing. Someone asked, you know, Van, you, you still have those 17 policies in your, in your roller bag that you drag around all day long? Show people your po I just want you to have one of these. Here's how that works. I'd like you to have one of these. You know, I put in 4,000 a year, and I get 4,000 a year out. Do you have one of those? Oh, yeah, you do. Right? And remember, that's another great line about closing. Remember, you can't buy life insurance. You can only apply for it. You can't buy, well, I don't, I'll buy it next week. Well, I'm not asking you to buy it. I'm asking you to apply for it. They'll tell you if you can buy it. Oh, so there's not a, so, and by the way, pitter patter, as Freddie D. Donaldson, Enterprise Alabama, used to say, New York Life agent, what did he say? He said, we're only one heartbeat away from immortality, just one heartbeat away. And that's exactly what happens. One day, and he said this, he says, but it's over. It's over. Only apply for it. Remember, closing provides the answer, the solution to the problem that they wanted to solve. 
And that's why you, and you said this, Wendy, it was so cool. So should we handle this now? Or, I mean, let's just handle this now and we can get away. Would that be okay? Would that be okay if we had, right, and off we go. Just make them, here's the thing, when you solve the problem that you were looking to solve, make them stop you. Some people say, twist my arm, make me sell, make me sell it to you. Please, Jimmy, would you please pull out the application and sell me this life insurance? Would you please? Oh, I don't know. I'm not sure right now. Please. They get on their, people get on their, on, their, on their knees begging people. That's how it works. I've seen this. Okay, not the knees part, but they wait. They wait. The sales made five minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago, but they're still chatting away. Well, who said this the other day? So one, one of you guys was saying, said like, well, maybe it was here too, I forget. It was you, wasn't it? Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just think about it and I'll come back next week. <laughs> like, just give them an excuse and walk out. Solve problems. That's what we do. And remember, like Van says, a pro is never offended. One of the best lines you'll ever learn, Jeremy, isn't it? A pro is never offended. Because it's not about you. Never been about you. Never going to be about you. It's always about them. And they got worse problems than you. Right? They got 50 major problems right now. And at best, you're 51 on their list. They have no time for you. Well, what else? Deliver better. Value added comes from doing the unexpected. Today we mail a lot of stuff out. We digitally, we digital, digitize email um, policies. I think it's horrible. It's a $5 million policy. I'll just send you a digital thing. Print it out for yourself on 20 point, fo 20 point uh, you know, photocopy paper. Dang. Right? Do you, do you, do you provide a, a, a file folder, a fo or rather some sort of portfolio for that? Well, no, no, it, it comes in a portfolio. I said, what do you mean it comes in a portfolio? Well, I, well, it has a snap, it has a sort of a Ziploc lid on it and everything. <laughs> well, that ought to make it special, right? You do God's work. Think about this. So you want to make it ceremonial, ceremonial, especially if it's digital, especially if it's digital. You want to read the contract with them and explain what it says, and nobody does this anymore. Here's your contract. Good luck to you. Bye. See you. And uh, I love you. Bye. But you can. And that's how Van makes more sales. Van doesn't, well, I have to wait an appropriate length of time before I can sell somebody else something else. And that's at least um, eight years. Van doesn't do that. He, he, he'll sell another case on delivery. Six months later, he gets another idea. George, I was just, in fact, George and I do, George is one of my agents. He's like my key friend of agents. But, but he's, my, he's my guy. He says, Jimmy, I have an idea. I just think you should look at it. You think I look at it? Absolutely. You think I buy every single thing he ever tells me? Yes. That's what I do. So include that call me if letter. You saw that. Joy, whether Van has the, that's a brilliant thing. I have another version. Uh, you, can, you can use his, you can use, but you read it to people. That was the key that Van said. You don't just say, oh, here's something to look at. You read it to them. And you promise regular courtesy calls. You do all this stuff. That delivers this. What else? Number 10. Finally, I'll just finish this up. We're all done. Where am I here? 15 minutes over. Dear Jesus. Um, <clears throat> communicate regularly. Newsletters, one-pagers, uh, social media, whatever you're doing, handing out reports. Communicate with your clients. They leave you. I think you said this. They tend to, or Arwen, someone said, about we leave uh, advisors because of poor communication. So communicate. Do that. Do courtesy calls. You know, Mr. S Mr. S Sigurdsson, um, it's Jim Ruda, your insurance agent. This is just a courtesy call, like I said before. Annual reviews. Man, I asked the guy once, I said, how many years does it, do you think it should take to do an annual review? <laughs> so I'm thinking this is going to give it away, right? I'm thinking. But no, no, there's a guy sitting where Bo is, puts up his hand. Uh, th uh, three. I said, three years? Yeah, we've done, that. we've done the analysis and the math because we wanted Arvin to be happy. We got the data, the data. It's three years. You know, one of the best questions you can ever ask for prospecting with your existing clients would simply be this. Would you have any objection to reviewing your life insurance policies with me? Because do you think people, by the way, it's a prospecting call for anybody. Would you have any objection? You know why, and you want to say it like that? Because would you have any objection if they say no, they mean yes. It's the greatest question ever. 
beneficiary audits. You heard about those before. We do that. Help them do all this stuff. George does this. Advisors do this. And they get a tons, of, tons of business. Social media as a brand builder and a potential sales maker, for me, more than anything. And it's, I don't want to get involved in social, in, in social media funnels. I don't want to get in all that stuff. I just don't want to. I think you need a little bit to, to build your brand. I think it's a useful thing. But in any event, so key takeaways, quickly. Prospecting is all about eliminating non-buyers. Number two, plan while protected, not while exposed to insurable threats. If people need two million, sell it to them. They need 10 million, sell it to them. Figure it out, figure out how it fits later, Melissa. That's the deal. Plan while protected, not while exposed. Life insurance for professional and civilian uses. Learn the professional uses of the product. Specialize and collaborate. That's the word for the, 20th, uh, the 21st century. Get in the way of new business. See the people. You don't, you know, how many people today are sitting in their basement office? In their, in their spare bedroom on the second floor, waiting for people to knock on the door and, and force them to buy something. It doesn't happen. What else? Practice to learn and be a real pro. Practice, practice, practice. Role play, rehearse, do this. Uncomplicate your life and your business and you will sell more every single time. Closing, remember this, closing solves their problem. And that's why you're obliged to do it. Make them stop you. Make delivery educational and special so they know what they've got and you've made it special so they want to keep it. I don't know, is retention important here in the US? Yeah, really important. Communicate, review regularly. And here's that line, when you serve more, you sell more. I have no prospects. Then get out there and talk to people. Just go see folks. What does Turner Thompson do? Just go, hi, I'm Turner Thompson. Right? The easiest stuff in the world. That's what this is all about. So you can, here's a little pitch for my own stuff, but you know, so, Ad Advisor Craft Solus is one of those opportunities where, you know, you can click on that thing. It's easy. It's solus.com. Advisorcraft.com, rather, solus. All these ideas directly from the people who said them, including Wendy, Van, Tom, George, for two hours. Two-hour directed conversation. See that music? Get the hell off the stage. <laughs> I get it. God bless you all. Thank you very much. It's a delight to be with you. I appreciate it.